what the Trump transition means for Ohio. Joining us this week on Columbus on the Record, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News, Joe Ingalls, reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Dale Butlin, Democratic strategist, and Gene Krebs, former state legislator. As we enter the second week of our new reality, Ohio and the nation are getting more and more used to the idea of Donald Trump as president of the United States. Some are adjusting more easily than others. There have been several anti-Trump protests in Columbus. That one at the State House was the largest. Others at Ohio State also drew large crowds. Meanwhile, the transition to power continues in Washington and New York City. Laura Bischoff, first to those protests, what, what do you think is fueling those? Are they trying to nullify the election, change the mind of the Electoral College? What are they trying to do? I think in general people are just trying to express their um, frustration and anger at the election results. I mean, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, Donald Trump won the electoral vote. This is the second time in 16 years that, that that's happened. Um, and I think, I, I don't know that anybody really truly believes that they can undo the election results. There's, there was no evidence that this was rigged. Um, you know, the biggest problem was that there were 100 million voters who stayed home and didn't bother to, to cast their ballots. I can't, re I can't recall similar, I recall similar protests after Al Gore won in 2000. I don't recall protests. You mean after Bush won. I mean, Al, Al Gore won the popular and George Bush won. Freudians lived yeah. there. Um, but I can remember the protests there. I don't remember similar protests in any other election year, presidential election year. Well, and that's ex exactly the point. Republicans have won, won before, but you didn't see these kinds of protests when Reagan was elected or the two Bushes were elected. Um, look, I think this is, because, this is happening because people are scared, genuinely scared. Uh, they're particularly people who are, who are immigrants, people of color. Uh, and largely because of the bigoted and sometimes violent tone of the Trump campaign. I think these people are scared and wondering whether they actually have a place in this society. Gene? And it also could be shattered expectations. Everybody said Hillary's going to win. We know now the polls were accurate within the, the, within the standard deviations. And I think this is like not unlike the 12 stages of grief for a lot of people, denial and eventually everything else. But look, in, a few, in, a, in, a, in just a few short days, Ohio State plays the school up north. How would everybody in this town feel if Ohio State were to lose? They'd, it's not dissimilar on a yeah. certain level. Expectations are Ohio State's going to win. If they lose, uh, it's going to be protests. Joe, do you think the protests continue? How long do they last? There's one scheduled for Monday night at the State House. I'm curious to see how that compares to the 2,000, 2,500 they, they got for that last one. Right. I think um, Dale's onto something when he says that there is an element of fear. I'm hearing that when I talk to people. Uh, they're saying that they don't know what to expect. And I think that's the biggest thing is the uncertainty. How will this new administration handle immigration? They've, um, you know, there have been mixed messages and they don't know which President Trump is going to appear and, and how they're going to be treated, especially if they're in populations that have um, been the target of um, hate, actually, uh, by some groups. Not, not, I'm not saying the Trump people or anyone, but there are incidents of hate crimes that have happened, and if they are targets of that, that makes them even more leery about this. So the Southern Poverty Law Center actually tracks uh, incidents of um, hate crimes and harassment, and there, were, uh, there was a spike after the election results uh, it, last report was uh, 437 incidences uh, nationwide. nationwide. Right. It could be also that the, you know people are more apt to report them. The consciousness is, is risen. It, it's it, it's going to take a little longer, but, but, but there right. but there are incidents out there. But let me say that when a candidate uh, is endorsed by hate groups like the KKK, and that candidate wins, it's not a surprise that some of those folks would feel emboldened. And I got to tell you, even though I'm not going to say that the, the number of hate crimes or incidents is spiking uh, beyond all uh, expectations, but I will tell you, a lot of these things are not reported. I'll give you an example. My daughter, here in town, uh, has a friend who is a woman of Indian descent. She's married to a medical doctor. They are both U.S. citizens. 
on Wednesday, last week, the day after the election, this woman went to her husband's m medical office on her way back to her car in the parking lot. She was approached by a white male who she'd never seen before who threw a cup of coffee on her and said, why don't you go back where you came from? Now, she didn't report that to the best of my knowledge, so that's the kind of thing that's not showing up, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Gene, what do you make of Donald Trump's first 10 days or so? I mean, his, his, his victory speech was very magnanimous, and then it, it's the 60 Minutes interview was also pretty low-key, pretty standard, but now he's made some cabinet appointments. What do you think? Uh, I think we have to see how all this plays out in action. Um, I'm one of those rare Republicans who, for example, I do believe that Obama was born in Hawaii and that he is actually a Christian and not a Muslim. Um, so but the thing that we have to separate out is always been, I've noticed with the, with the Obama administration, I'm going to apply the same standard. I want to be consistent. Obama talked one way, acted another. Uh, here's a red line in the sand on Syria. Well, that red line didn't mean anything. If you, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Um, I think we need to give, in, a, in effect, uh, give Trump some time to actually form his administration and see how these actions actually play out. I think we have to, like, we have, like I did when Obama got elected, give him the, the, a moment, if, just a, give him a few hours, if you will, after he gets elected and gets sworn in to actually be president and then start throwing rocks at him. Laura, the folks he's picked so far, Steve Bannon, Reince Priebus, um, you know, Jeff Sessions for Attorney General, all pretty far right loyalist folks who supported him in the campaign. Right, and so it shows that there's no bait and switch. He's not saying one thing on the campaign trail and then switching, switching gears now that he's president-elect. He's, he's following through, um, and I think that it signals like Jeff Ses Sessions as his nominee for Attorney General signals uh, that he's, he's gonna you know, work on some sort of immigration reform um, that, that would be akin to what he's uh, said in his uh, my campaign. My going to Dale's earlier incident point is there's been a lot of chatter about South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who is of Southeast Asian descent, uh, being named to a cabinet position. I think a few of those, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the uh, neurosurgeon Ben Carson. Ben Carson turned him down on yeah, the thing. No, no government experience. No government right. experience. Um, but uh, Nikki. <laughs> Which is why he ran for president, of course. Yes, I know. <laughs> Outsider but then. I, so good I was now. never, I, trust me, I admired Ben as a person, but uh, he was not my first choice. Um, but uh, Michelle Rhee, also Asian American, former superintendent of schools in D.C., has been named, mentioned as a right. possible education So I think, I think we still, look, he's 10 days in. Let's wait yeah. and see how things go a little bit. So, so yes, and on this I agree with Gene. I think these reports that the Trump transitions and chaos are a little premature. Let's see where we are a couple of weeks from now. But that said, I do think there's a couple of things about the appointments that have been made so far that are a little troubling to me. First is the apparent tone deafness of the president-elect when it comes to conflicts of interest with his own children. Ivana should not be advertising $10,000 bracelets on the official transition site, and the Trump children, who will now be running the Trump family business, should not be serving on a transition team where they are vetting the very appointees who will be regulating their business. Okay, let's get to how this might affect Ohio. Its position as a key bellwether swing state reaffirmed in the election. Ohio is trying to figure out what a Trump administration will mean. John Kasich was all set to run for president in 2020. Republicans expected to use an unpopular President Hillary Clinton against Democrats in 2018 statewide elections. And Ohio Democrats are trying to figure out how they can get working class voters back. I do know the voters we need to get back into the fold, and I probably know them as well uh, as any other political figure in the country. Yeah. Look, you know, the Obamas are gone, the Clintons are, gonna, are gone, the uh, Bidens are gone, yeah. Harry Reid's gone, there's no one at the DNC yeah. now. We've got we to gotta say, what's America 2.0 look like, Poppy? Mm. And how does the Democratic Party get policies and proposals to help us get to that new iteration America. of the United States of America? Congressman Tim Ryan from uh, now Purple Youngstown is eyeing Nancy Pelosi's job as House Minority Leader. Dale Butlin, can Democrats get the Youngstown, can, can they get those Youngstown working class folks back? Well, we better be able to. It's one of the reasons our party exists, and they have been our natural allies for many, many years. Look, 
<clears throat> I think it's important that the Democrats don't overlearn the results of this election. Let's remember, we did win the popular vote for the sixth time uh, out of the last seven presidential elections. If a relative handful of votes had switched in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, uh, Hillary would be present today. But at the same time, it is true that she had no coherent economic message that resonated with people who take their showers after they come home from work, uh, people who are in what the media sometimes condescendingly refers to as flyover country, and we've got to reconnect with those voters. There is no reason that we can't, and we're not going to win many elections if we don't. And actually, to build upon something that Dale said, the, traditionally these are often called Reagan Democrats. I prefer the phrase Bourbon Democrats, which goes back to the age of Grover Cleveland. I think that's where the true philosophy lies more. But notice, by, by inclination, they tend to go more for the D. And um, uh, the problem is, is that they drink bourbon. And you compare that to the classic limousine liberal who's sitting there with a, you know, with a glass of Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc, okay, they have a hard time translating. And um, I think that what uh, Trump was able to do was to say, look, I'm hearing what you're saying. It is amazing that, yes, a guy who is that rich was able to come up with a framing structure that, that hit all of their nerves so very well. But he is from Queens, and maybe that may have given him some insight growing up in that community. Trump has always that. appealed to the working class, even in New York. He was more of a New York Post guy than a New York Times guy. I mean, yeah. it, that's where, where the folks who liked him read that paper rather than the Times. Joe, um, what do Democrats do in 2018? Because now, usually the first midterm after a presidential election mm -hmm. goes against the party in power. So that has to give Democrats in Ohio a little more hope for the governor's race and some of these other statewide offices True. coming up in two years. True. And you don't have to introduce uh, Sherrod Brown, Senator Sherrod Brown, to Ohioans. They already know him. So he has a name recognition factor. I think for Democrats, they're going to really have to stand back. And, and as Dale said, they're going to have to let the process work. But they're going to have to speak out each and every time they see a policy that they differ with and that they would do differently. They need to make that case. They need to go in there and make that case to the voter in 2018 and not wait until four months before an election to start gearing up. I mean, the next election starts now for Democrats. And here I'm going to do a dangerous thing. I want to speak about the Democrats. But it, they need to, at, at the ODP level and at the national level, they need to figure out who and what they are, and they need to get the benches trained. And I still go back to, it was a tragedy. You were backing P.G. Sittenfeld for the U.S. Senate. I still think that R Rob Portman would have beat him, but you would have had new voices and new ideas going on. And I early made the prediction on this show that Hillary would not be the nominee because I was expecting a fully functional national DNC, but now we know from WikiLeaks that never occurred. So the challenge for the Ds in Ohio and indeed all around America is to get yourself going on an honest basis. And I have to commend your previous candidate. I actually thought he could have been part of the next wave, but now he might as well go and make himself millions out in, out in a hedge fund somewhere. Well, we do need to, I'm sorry, Laura, go say, ahead. You know, the Democrats are in a bad, bad position. Since 2008, they've lost uh, a net of 13 governorships, nine Senate seats, 63 House seats, almost 1,000 state legislative seats, and 29 legislative chambers. They, got a, they have to, they need to retool. Well, that's actually where I was going. Uh, we can't any longer depend on winning the popular vote in a presidential election to lead us to victory. The Republicans have been eating our lunch when it comes to governorships, when it comes to state legislatures. Um, and so we need to take a page, frankly, out of, the, out of the, the, the Republican playbook. We need to start building from the ground up, and we, start, and we need to start winning uh, some state and local elections. Do Democrats have the patience for that? Well, we're going to have to. I mean, uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, is, is that you, you know, when you look at where this election was, uh, it was all blue on each coast and then a sea of red in between. And we just can't win like that. And there's no reason that we should have to. I mean, the, the, the people who have been abandoning us, you know, we've got to get back while at the same yeah. time giving the Obama coalition of, of you know, minorities, women, and young people a reason to show up and vote, which they did not do this last time. 
Lord, what happens to John Kasich now? He was all set to give a speech two days after the election in Washington, D.C. He was eyeing 2020. He still could be eyeing 2020. You have to figure if Trump is unpopular, which is possible, four years from now, he might primary challenge him, right? He, he might, but I think that that is, um, it, the, the chances of that happening are slimmer and slimmer. Um, I think that, uh, you know, he would have to win in a GOP primary, which is, you know, you, maybe you got to go far to the right, and John Kasich is not a far to the right kind of guy. Um, I think um, there's a chance he might run for Senate in 2018 in Ohio uh, against Sherrod Brown, um, but there's also a chance he finishes his term, he goes and plays golf, and he writes another couple books. No chance Mitt Romney's meeting with uh, Donald Trump this weekend, Joe. No chance that John Kasich meets in Trump Tower and looks at budget director or something like that? I've learned to never say no chance. <laughs> but I do think, I agree with Laura. I mm -hmm. think um, John Kasich, is, uh, Governor Kasich, is just going to kind of look and survey, see what's out there, and for right now he's going to lay low. But, you know, we've got to remember 2018 is two years from now. That's a long time in, in politics. politics. Yeah. So I, I remember Senate Bill 5 when that came about and everyone said, oh, this is just going to sink John Kasich. He's, uh -huh. he's not going to be able to be reelected. And, you know, of course, three years later he was. So, um, you know, it's a long time. We've got to, you know, stand back and kind of watch what happens. Donald Trump repeatedly promised he would repeal and replace Obamacare as president. But now he likes parts of the law, the popular parts. He says he wants to keep insurance companies from denying coverage for pre-existing conditions. He says young adult children should be able to stay on their parents' plans. It's safe to say, though, that the law is in limbo, as are the 800,000 Ohioans who either enrolled through the exchange or qualified for expanded Medicaid. Gene Krebs, what will Obamacare look like a year from now? Um, hopefully more intellectually honest than what it currently is structured. And by that I mean it's called the Affordable Care Act. It should be called the Accessibility Care Act. It's not about affordability, it's about accessibility. We've completely overlooked that aspect of it. And as such, then the costs have gone up. Um, I think that what you're going to see is um, the impact on Ohio is going to be interesting because if you look at, the, for example, the state, this is really inside baseball, but Obamacare allowed for certain fees and taxes to go on on hospitals and drugs and things of that nature. That may be eliminated going forward, which could have a real impact. At the same time, if they send the money to the state, you know, especially for Medicaid uh, expenditures and other things along human services, as like they've been talking about, tranches or block grants, that could give the state the flexibility to work with their local partners, especially in the 501c3 area, and come up with some really more better and innovative things out there and expand upon certain things that are out there right now that Dale, are working. Dale, it's going to be hard. The law is six years old, basically. It's been two terms. <clears throat> Parts are very well established, both as far as folks who have insurance through Obamacare now and the insurance industry and the hospital industry, which are now used to it and using Obamacare as mm foundation to pay their bills and, and get their revenues. How hard is it going to be to unwind all that? Well, it's going to be hard, but it, it's going to be particularly hard because there are 22 million Americans who now have health insurance thanks to Obamacare who previously didn't. And the Republicans who for six years have talked about repeal and replace, repeal and replace, they've been great on the repeal part. They've done that 50 times, but we still don't know what the replace part looks like. And, and, and the one thing we do know for sure, though, is that oh, Trump says he wants to keep the most popular features of Obamacare, like, for example, uh, making insurance companies cover pre-existing conditions. Well, it's going to be really hard to do that unless you have everybody in the pool, which Without is the what mandate. the individual mandate yeah. was all about. Otherwise, people game uh, you know, the system and don't buy insurance until they get sick, which takes the whole thing down. But oh, Paul Ryan does have a plan. It's been out there for 15 months. Uh, but I think the word that I wish the media would use rather than repeal or replace or anything like that is unravel because it's such an intricate web that you're going to have to be very patient at this. Pull a string here, see what happens, look at this over here. This is not going to be easy to do, and I, I don't think we're ever going to be able to unravel all of it. You know, it's not the media that's that's labeling it repeal and replace. It's right. the Republicans that have been saying repeal and replace. I know, exactly. but, th but and, it, and it is an unraveling. And I think it's up to the media, though, to no, it, be I mean, honest they, about they it. They have been fully upfront saying they, wanna, they want to rip it up. 
and right. replace it with something else. And that and they've taken 50 votes right. to do that and right. Right. over and over. And may I just say this, since my friend Gene here just referenced uh, Paul Ryan's plan, a key feature of that plan, as is this case with Donald Trump, who talks about selling insurance across state lines. Well, you know something? <clears throat> it's already perfectly legal to sell insurance across state lines under the Affordable Care Act. The problem is uh, that not one single insurance company has volunteered to sell a policy that's been approved in one state to consumers in another. Not the, and the reason is you can't find a network. If a person in Ohio wants to buy a policy from North Dakota, you can't find doctors or hospitals that are in the network here in the state of Ohio. So that's no answer at all. Speaking of doctors and hospitals, Joe, what do insurance companies think of Obamacare? There's more people insured, yeah. there's so there's more people less insured. free care through either through Medicaid expansion or the exchanges. Right. I think the biggest thing is we've got to remember why Governor Kasich wanted it to begin with, mm -hmm. and that was to reimburse the hospitals. Mm -hmm. Because the hospitals, especially those smaller hospitals in areas where there were uh, you know, where they were kind of failing because there's not enough patients who actually can pay the bills. And those hospitals have been propped up with Obamacare. And that's why, uh, that was a major reason why Ohio got into it in the first place. And I think it's going to be very difficult if you're not supporting those hospitals and whatever plan comes about, that's going to be something we're gonna see a lot of lobbying for. But if Trump supporters will be upset, Laura, if in the first 100 days there's not a repeal, I would guess. Uh, yes, although I think there's a lot of Trump supporters that are actually on Obamacare. Yeah. So we'll have to see how it works out. <clears throat> New high school standards for graduation are coming under fire. Hundreds of local school leaders converged on the state house this week to protest the tougher standards and requirements. So far, more than a third of Ohio high school uh, students are not on track to get their diplomas in 2018. Many educators say harder tests could lead to sharp drops in graduation rates. If the current graduation standards remain in place for the class of 2018 in Olmsted Falls, we will plummet to about 68%. While we recognize and respect and absolutely agree with the board's desire to raise the standard for a high school diploma in Ohio, we're concerned with the speed at which it's being done. Joe Ingalls, the speed at which it's being done, this was approved in 2014. That's right. two years. It doesn't go right. into effect for two more years. How slowly do they want it to go? The problem is if you look at the underclassmen, the sophomores and the juniors, they're not performing well right now. They're not on track to be able to graduate. And that 68% that he referred to, actually in some school districts, it's lower than that. And if you look at uh, some of the Republican senators who are uh, key in this debate, they're saying, if you don't you know, do something here and fix it, then the legislature is going to have to come back because they're not going to, it, let's face it, the state doesn't want to have 44% of its students not able to graduate because its standards are too high. Laura, these were supposed to get students ready for the workforce. These new standards, tougher standards, supposed to get students ready for the workforce. If they lower the standards, will the students be ready for the workforce? Well, it, you know, that's the big question is, is how important are these standards um, to getting re ready for the workforce and also ready for college. There's been a, lo a lot of students end up needing remediation when they get to college, and that's really expensive. 40%. And it, right, school, and it goes yeah. to the college affordability prob problem. So, I mean, I think that they do have to push for the standards, but, um, you know, it is a big concern for, you know, urban and Appalachia students who uh, are in kind of tough districts. How about this for an idea? <clears throat> what if, uh, since it's pretty clear, I mean, if they don't do something and you get 30% of the state's high school students not graduating, uh, legislators and the State Board of Education are going to face a full-on revolt from parents. Mm -hmm. So how about we involve teachers and superintendents, people who are on the front lines of education, in drawing up these standards and these tests that are being they, used? They weren't in 2014, Jim? Not yeah, much. They were. Yeah, here's the thing. And I'm going to go back a quarter century when I was on a local school board, and that's when the state first started to do this testing. And what we encountered right away was what we called the Lake will be gone effect where all the children are above average. And all the principals and superintendents said, oh, all of our students know everything they need to know. Then they took the test and we found they didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And so this is what, and I think, but the key problem we're having here, and I do respect Senator Peggy Lehner for her work in all this, the problem we may have here is so many cooks in the kitchen. We have the legislature, we have the state board, we have the governor, we have everybody. 
All right, we'll get to our off-the-record final parting shots, and we'll start with Gene Krebs. Um, my very good friend uh, John Begala has recently re released a new paper on the impact, the troubling impact that small towns are having with a whole host of problems. You can find it on the Center for Community Solutions website. It might give you some hints as to what's been fueling the recent Trump phenomena in rural Ohio. We'll put that link on our Facebook page. Dale. If Ohio Democrats need uh, candidates who can appeal to working class voters, I've got two words, Jerry Springer. Now, I don't know whether the former talk show host and mayor of Cincinnati would be willing to run, but he's smart, he's charismatic, he is articulate, and I can tell you from personal experience, he's got this exact same kind of appeal to working class voters that Donald Trump does, except without the bigotry and the racism. Ohio Democrats ought, ought, ought to be giving Jerry a call. Joe. Thanksgiving's coming up. I think this Thanksgiving's going to be difficult for a lot of families because the talk is going to turn political and uh, most families I know have splits there. So bring on the Excedrin because you'll probably need it. Stick the football, Laura. All right, so it's a topsy-turvy world. The, you know, the Chicago Cubs are the world champions. Donald Trump is president-elect. Brangelina is broken up. Uh, for my, the next uh, big thing to shake the earth will be Michigan will beat Ohio State by two points. <laughs> Says the University of Michigan grad. Right. All right. Of course, this has been a sad week for those of us in public media. We, uh, the PBS NewsHour and Washington Week, lost Gwen Eiffel to cancer. We certainly will miss her groundbreaking journalistic talent and her grace on our televisions every night and every week. And, of course, we're going to miss that smile. If you get a chance, read David Brooks's tribute to her in the New York Times. It's also posted at the Columbus on the Record Facebook page. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. For our panel and for our crew who did a heroic job getting us onto this new set, yeah. I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.